What's up, guys? So today on the podcast, we have Chris Howder, who is one of the first uh, 12 American black belts referred to pretty commonly as a dirty dozen. Um, an interesting guy. We got into, I, I felt like I met my match or my superior in rambling. Um, in a good way. It was very interesting. I, I love when people like philosophize on an idea and they go down these different like rabbit holes that make you think differently. And um, I enjoyed the I enjoyed the conversation with him and enjoyed the uh, the episode there. So again, I hope you guys enjoy it. Again, he's someone with a just lifetime, literally, of knowledge and, and experience with uh, martial arts and grappling arts and things of that nature. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode. As always, our big thanks to our sponsor, Charlotte's Web. They help make this podcast happen so that you guys can get free episodes to listen to while you're driving to work on Monday, or I guess maybe if we're working from home, because not everybody's driving, you know, COVID, Rona, and um, whatever else. And, uh, you know, again, I always kind of encourage people to check it out right now if you want to. If you want to check it out, they've got a 30% uh, off coupon. You can go to their website and use the promo code JUJITSU30, save 30% off. Uh, and again, recent success, I guess you would say success story, where it was more recent, like, I, I enjoy stuff. So, like, I enjoy, like, when I give someone something and it works for them. Like, if I give someone a technique and it's useful to them, I, it makes me excited. If I give someone, like, for instance, one of the uh, – I have a small group of guys that I, that do, like, uh, that are gym owners or business owners, and I do consulting with them, a little mm-hmm. small group. And, um, I you know, if I give someone something and, like, they try this out and it works for them, and, it, you know, it's, it's super fun to see. Yeah. And um, – I enjoy it with supplements too, like giving someone an adjust, like giving someone a supplement and trying it. And uh, one of the guys at the gym who's a black belt, he started taking CBD. I gave him a free sample um, of one of my one of mine. It was one of the tinctures. I think it was the lemon twist one, but a little tincture. And I got him to try it. And I honestly had forgotten all about it. Didn't think anything of it. He comes up to me a few weeks ago and he says, "Hey, Chewy, uh, what was the milligrams on that tincture?" And I said, "Oh yeah," and it was this. And he, I was like, "Why do you ask?" He's like, "Dude," he goes, "My sleep was great." He's like, I definitely noticed the difference. Mm. Um, you know, he, he's taking, uh, in addition, in case you're curious, he's taking magnesium, uh, zinc, and then the CBD with it. And that's the same thing I take. I take magnesium at night, I take zinc, and I take the CBD when I go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that right there is amazing for my sleep. Um, if you guys don't know the benefits of magnesium and zinc for your sleep, you should look them up. And then again, check out some of the, the information that's out there on uh, CBD and how it can help uh, different things in your body, everything from, you know, um, inflammation and just an overall sense of well-being, this kind of stuff. But look it up. And uh, again, if you want to try out a month supply and just sort of take a test, take a test drive, see if it works for you, you can go to their website, 30% off of all their products, including their uh, their CBD rubs and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of their, um, their like sports balms and stuff. Like after the uh, after the Nogi Pans tournament, I had to put some of that stuff on. It was helpful for getting my shoulder just kind of back out of yeah. C- just because it was it was just from snapping people's heads down and stuff, just overuse. Uh, so that's that. Um, also, big thanks to our sponsor, Epic Roll, EpicRollBJJ.com. Right now, he has a special thing going on at the time of filming this or at the time of recording this. You can go to his website and check it out. He's got an ocean storm gi, which I believe is gray and black. Yeah, it's like gray. It look it reminds me of the gray and black gis that I did for my uh, my jujitsu gis, which are no longer available. So there, I'm, I'm not I'm not making them again. Mm-hmm. That's it. Um, so if you missed out on those gray and black gis and you thought the design looked cool, go to his website, epicworldbjj.com, and right now he's got like a special going on where if you get in there, um, you can get tw- It's like it's basically ninety eight dollars. How do they do that? So he basically he's got Jujitsu Thirty is the code. Okay, and you get thirty percent off of everything. All right. And so the gi is on pre order, mm-hmm. so you can pre order it, and if you can use the code, it applies. Yeah. It'll end up ninety eight dollars for a brand new gi. Ninety eight bucks for a brand new gi, and, and trust me, if you've if you've never worn a gray and black gi, if it's allowed in your gyms, because I know it's not allowed in everybody's gyms, it's a sharp it's a sharp contrast. And I remember, like when I, I originally got my, because uh, I got the gray and black geese for my my guys at the gym. I started wearing the YouTube channel, and everybody's like, "Bro, I want one! I want mm-hmm. one!" And I ended up selling. I did a pre sale for two hundred. Wow, sold out in a couple of days. Yeah, you know what I mean. So again, if you want to get in on that, uh, and again, ninety eight bucks. That's a that's an inexpensive gee. Uh, it comes with a gee bag and everything else. Check them out. EpicRollBJJ Promo code is Jujitsu thirty. That also includes everything else in the store, not just the. Um, 
not just the the gi itself. Uh, and then again, guys, uh, one more uh, sponsor that we've recently brought on that, that's kind of given us some stuff to try. And again, uh, I'm always reluctant to 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 bring people on because I'm like, if someone comes on the show, I actually have to try their product before I'm even going to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want to have to tell someone like, hey, <laughs> I don't like your product. I'm not pushing this stuff. Yeah. So uh, we recently, Manscaped sent us out some stuff. And, you know, the, they, they sent us out the trimmer. I think they call it the lawnmower. Lawnmower, yeah. And so, you know, I, uh, I used it on my, my beard and my chest hair. You know, that's what I use though, because because my girlfriend. So maybe this is TMI for some people. My girlfriend, she comes in and like, because I always miss spots. She grooms you. She grooms me. She, <laughs> she shears me, right? Like, um, she she goes through and like gets all the spots because I miss spots. Yeah. I don't know about you. Like when I try to do it myself, I always miss like patches. So yeah. I have like little patches everywhere. And uh, so again, she she tried it out, and the the trimmer was actually really good. The um. It was. It got caught in my beard a little bit. My beard's a little thick, yeah. but it was great for the chest hair. Mm-hmm. Um, so if any of you guys are kind of bushy like me, and like maybe you feel like you know my um, both my woman likes me to be a little <laughs> bit shaved, and for my own vanity's sake, like I'm right now like leaned out and stuff, so I can yeah. see the muscles better if I yeah. if I'm a little bit more trim. Um, but the uh, the actual trimmer was really good for it. So um, if you guys want to check out any of their products in their uh, the tonic that they have, it says it's. <laughs> I, it makes me laugh because every every if you've seen their stuff, it's all about balls. Yes, all about balls. But again, you can use it for your chest hair. But their quote ball tonic uh-huh. it smells really nice. Yeah, I, I I I used it just like a spritz. I put it in my beard. I was just like, it's just it looks like it's just aftershave or whatever. Well, but it's it's safe to use everywhere. Use a, your imagination if you want to. But is that it, what it says? Well, no. I'm, oh, just, like, <laughs> I'm just saying that the trimmer is safe to use everywhere. <laughs> remember that. <laughs> remember that female deodorant back in the day was like strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. Made for a woman. What it's was like that? it's like strong. It's secret. Oh, okay. um, it's strong enough for your balls, but made for every, but it'll work everywhere else. Yeah. Uh, but no, it actually smells good. It's kind of a woodsy smell. But anyway, yeah. if you want to check out their uh, their trimmer, it, it's a it's a nice piece of equipment. Um, and uh, the packaging super cool, and all the little uh, little things that come. Yeah, with it. Yeah, I think the one that they sent us, I'm, it's the perfect package 3.0. So it's got like um, it has like some boxers that came with it. So that's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. It's got the trimmer, and it's got a couple of. Um, uh, it's got a little bag that comes with it as well, and so it's ninety nine bucks, and then you can use a promo code Shujitsu and get twenty percent off. Twenty so. percent off. So twenty percent off of it if you want to check it out. If you need a new trimmer, um, again, just to kind of get in different spots. And it's a small thing, so it can kind of get into some tight spots. Yeah, it's it's actually I thought it was really really nice quality. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna use it on my nether region as, as that's that that's it's it's. It's thing, right? It's all That's about the, thing, the balls. Yeah. So I'll, I'll use it and I'll let you guys know. Not that you really <laughs> care and that you want to know, but maybe you're a guy and you're watching this and you're like, hey, I need something for that, you know? I yeah, don't know. it can get out of hand. Yeah. Those areas can get out of hand. Too. I guess so. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, guys as always if you want to support the podcast directly check out our patreon patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast um, again that's uh, where we take a lot of back end content we put it in there um, there's also some different extras everything from workout programs that we've p- uh, put up before there's full link seminars or there's warm up videos and stuff from the competition stuff from my classes that don't make it anywhere else on YouTube or the internet so if you want to check it out you can do that and there's also a option to where you can do some live zoom calls with me once every other week or so uh, most often if you want to check that out just go to patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast if you want to jump in with all that said let's jump into the podcast chris are you are you all in california yes where at exactly redondo beach so okay well, you guys, I guess, yeah. I guess that's fairly big, fairly big city, big area, like heavily populated. Redondo Beach is a suburb of Los Angeles, which of course is huge. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 60 years ago, you could say it wasn't LA, but basically LA is a collection of communities that all grew into each other. I got you. Yeah, the cities kind of continuously expand, and people just kind yes. of move out and so forth. Yeah, what's it like living out there? Well, um, I think that'd be one of those questions. That's kind of like any 
any area, especially urban areas, it all it depends upon where you live in LA. Uh -huh. There are areas of LA that I think are absolute shitholes and there's no way I would ever live there. And then there's other areas of LA that are really nice. And as of course, like all major urban areas that are nice, it's rapidly gentrifying and mm. the areas that are nice are becoming more and more expensive to live in the areas that are not are becoming worse and not any cheaper to live, which is why people are moving out of yeah. LA, San Francisco, New York, because if you ain't m making a hundred grand or more a year, it's kind of well, cost prohibitive. Yeah. Is there any, you know, as far as you feel any advantages to living in that area? I mean, right now, obviously not, but you know, for, for you being a, I guess kind of that area was a hotbed for jujitsu for, you know, a yes. long time. Southern California, Los Angeles, largely as a result of the weather, which brought in Hollywood and the aerospace industry. Um, Hollywood has always attracted martial artists. Mm. Every, be, partially because, um, you know, you can almost go back before films where, Wrestling was a thing where the only way you could make money doing real wrestling was to uh, put on shows and make it fake wrestling. And before um, the TV and film, fake wrestling was actually a lot more real. The part that was fake or a show what was everything around it and then the actual wrestling matches were more real and then once the um the tv came along and you re you realize your job is to put the butts in seats not have a real sport then it branched off and of course hollywood was always the place where it would attract guys that want to be in martial arts films. So LA was kind of the spot from Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, the Gracies, everybody would come to LA. Um, not that New York and Hawaii and other areas weren't also martial arts hotspots, but LA has always been a martial arts Mecca, mm. one could say. So that's kind of where, where essentially in, in the States, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, if people don't know, or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, kind of, that's kind of where it all started. Yes. And you are. Yes. Now, now, of course, like everything in this strange post, the truth era we are in, I'm sure we could argue whether that's actually true, right? Because sure. I know that, um, uh, a Carly a Gracie was in Northern California. Um, of course, Hawaii with Helson Gracie and Horion Gracie was in Los Angeles. And so I, I don't know which ones came first, but clearly Horion through the result of marketing the well, Gracie Challenge and mm -hmm. UFC was the one that got the most notoriety out of the early well, Gracies and other uh, Brazilians. And of course, he's the one who really blew this thing up. Mm -hmm. And so how did you get your start? Um, out of curiosity, how did you get started in martial arts in general? Did you do something before jiu-jitsu or was that your first one? I did. Um, you know, growing up, like a lot of us, I was insecure, I stuttered, I was small, I, I'm a lightweight, right? Um, it, and in an open class world, being a lightweight's always a challenge. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, 
when I, I, I don't think I'm insecure anymore, but of course, when you are insecure, the last thing you want to admit is that you're insecure. <laughs> um, and I think the combat sports and the fake martial arts mm. are both things that attract guys like myself. I don't know about y you guys, but we want to mix it up. Yeah. And um, the combat sports, which I call as of right now, are MMA, boxing, Muay Thai, Le Jiu Jitsu, Le Judo, wrestling, whether it's freestyle, a collegiate, or Greco. Um, those sports offer the best game and bang for your buck <laughs> if you like to mix it up. Whereas other sports, which I enjoyed as well, they didn't offer quite that reward that you get from one-on-one -on -one of combat sports where it's all you. You can have, you know, your sparring partners, your coaches and all that. But once you slap hands, it's just you and your opponent. You don't have a team. It's, it attracted uh a personality like mine. I started with, you know, I did Shotokan karate and the local Kung Fu club and other stuff and watched Kung Fu but movies. I have a story that's not unlike almost all of the guys my age group. Um, and by luck stumbled into reality arts. And I always knew that the karate and Kung Fu Fu that I was learning because I was always in schoolyard altercations wasn't very effective. And most of the fantasy martial arts are kind of run on a promise that there's a place that you will arrive in which suddenly it will work, where uh, the magic occurs. Um, you're not at a high enough level yet, or you're not where you need but to be it, in the hierarchy of the of Kung Fu style or whatever it is. Oh, my wife brought me a cup of coffee. She's sweet. She's really sweet. Well, Sometimes. my <laughs> wife is tough. My wife's tough. So tough. Yeah. But beats me up. But oh, oh, <laughs> Only because I'm old and out of shape right now. <laughs> yeah. Because, that look. Because what you said, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you train as well, right? By the best. I trained her. Yeah. <laughs> she knows my game inside and out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't w want to ramble, guys any time interject and cut me off and switch the oh topic. dude please ramble i'm enjoying it because i you know for me i started off watching blood sport as a kid got into taekwondo went through all that stuff like you said grew up insecure got into wrestling it was a transformative experience that then led me into yeah. jujitsu and mma so i'm enjoying it man so if you want to ramble brother like go, go ahead and keep rambling good um so yeah um high school Wrestling was my first real experience with a reality-based combat sport. And that was 1979. Mm -hmm. And that was when most people, uh, the vast majority, did not see wrestling as a combat sport. Um, the, the world was basically tricked into seeing martial arts as a being exclusively Asian. Um, a boxing, fencing, wrestling, the Western martial arts were seen as just sports. And um, obviously, as you know, once you leave a year of high school wrestling, a practice you're convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt the efficacy of wrestling as a combat art yeah but that once you get them on the ground and on top 
or in a headlock, right? You can pummel them. And, um, and I think like all combat sports, as opposed to pure combat martial arts, in contrast to the fantasy martial arts, the combat sports create rules and we have to have rules because otherwise we get injured or maimed. Mm -hmm. And in, in order to both protect the athlete and preserve the art, we create systems of rules. And what humans do, what a culture does is but create rules. And the rules both entrap the art, but they also allow one but to specialize in a range or a part of hand-to-hand -hand a combat that would be ignored or unmastered if not. So the collegiate wrestling is, if, if I would have one line Collegiate wrestling is the art of staying on top no matter what, motherfucker. <laughs> Boxing is the sweet science of exchanging blows and getting the best deal at the end of the exchange. Mm. The perfect deal is you don't hit me because I move and I hit you. And the perfect deal in any reality sport, as we know, is non-existent. The fantasy martial artist is searching for that perfect exchange. Mm. And the shattering that they have when they're engaged in a reality-based combat sport is the shattering of that illusion that there is such thing as the perfect game. Now, of course, as you guys all know, we've all had the match, whether we won or lost, where it was either us or our opponent got the perfect game on us. And the perfect game, we walked out, we slapped hands, boom, they sunk the takedown, they were on top, we were pinned. Or boom, I pulled a flying arm bar, he tapped. Or bam, round one, but ding, ding, I dodged a jab and bam, I tagged him, knocked him out, game over, right? Um, so even the combat athlete knows out there is an ideal of the perfect match, but we also know that that is a fluke and rare. And that the, the more evenly matched and the longer it goes on, the more the micro adjusting happens, but but to our opponent's game, and then it becomes who's in the best shape and who wants it more. That then it's the mind, right? But the mind and the body. And so you have the art experience and skills, you have your body, the athlete, the vehicle of the art, and then you have the mind. And I'm, I'm all over the map here, but I, I teach everything in a threes, in a triangle. Be, and not because that's reality, but because that's how I can get myself out of the trap of the binary. Mm. Which is, but the trap is, it's either sport or it's a real fight. No, mm. it's not. It's either up or it's down. It's either grappling or it's striking. It's either this and that. But to break that apart, you have to introduce a third view, a point of view. And as a Taoist, who won't admit I'm a Taoist, because that would not be <laughs> a, a proper Taoist, sure. the only escape out of the binary which we can never escape is creating the illusion of it, of looking outside of the binary. And which is why my whole basic 
philosophical approach to martial arts as a whole is we think street with our mind because that's why we are all here. The most primal reason is I want to win if life and limb are involved. We think street, we train sport because our, we have our bodies and a short life and a short athletic window and we have to train our bodies. And the sport, we create man-made rules in order but to enhance an aspect or an area of an art or a style. And that's, and, but those are the sports. We, we make a game out of it because the sport is practical. Mm -hmm. It's in a practical just to have a complete no rules fight. Sure. Even, even an unlicensed, non-sanctioned brawl in a pub or in, in Uncle Paul's yard still has the cultural rules. Sure. It still has other often males huddling around organizing how it's done. That is sport too. Mm. So when I say think street, I don't mean a, a duel between men. That is a sport. Whether it's legal or not, it is still sport. What I mean is survival combat. When I mean sport, I mean all aspects. From Uncle Chuck's, Uncle Chuck's barnyard grapple off rules to Aunt the Pauline slap fight rules to IBJ, <laughs> the JF to MMA rules to high school wrestling rules to international but taekwondo rules all these are rules right and we as humans give these sanctioning groups whether we want to call them public or a private legal or not we give them the authority to guide us in what we call being rules mm. and then the art the art is of what jujitsu say is how do I control and submit my opponent utilizing the least amount of athletics and the maximum amount of knowledge, skill, but cunningness and guile. The sport is how do I control and submit my opponent utilizing all of my art and the maximum amount of my athletics within the man-made rules of the venue. The street is, I don't even describe, because we all at a primal level know what that really means. Hmm. And Seems that is my general approach to all combat arts. So searching for the, the middle way and all that stuff instead of trying to, like you said, put it into a nice, neat little box that you can say yes or no to. Yes. Um, so I got one more point I got to add. Sure. And the middle way, if one extreme is black and the other is white, the middle way then is gray, right? Mm -hmm. But you cannot tell what is gray without having a black or a white. Mm, sure. And that is why we have to at least mentally explore extremes. And I believe as a complete martial artists you have to explore the extreme range of hands only combat boxing of hands and feet and knees and elbows muay thai the art of being the guy on top motherfucker wrestling which is probably one of the hardest working combat sports mm -hmm. wrestling but boxing is probably the most punishing of the combat sports but anyways ask your question 
No, no, I, I was just listening. Yeah, I think that uh, Muay Thai and, and boxing are both punishing just because of the, the striking, the damage that comes from it. I remember gra- I could grapple forever and then you go do like a, a round of boxing or kickboxing, you just leave beat up and bruised, your jaw sore, legs are sore, everything. Um, so how did you get, so you started in high school wrestling like uh, you know, yes. back in the day. How did you, you know, because you, you've got this really interesting philosophy, which I find refreshing, especially because a lot of people that I feel like come from the, I quote, say this, the old school background, a lot of times really just they hate on the sport, whereas you're finding this, no, no, the sport has its place. This has its place. This has its place. But where did you get started? Like when, when did you get started in jiu-jitsu and how did that even come about? I'm curious. Well, the one thing I will say that, and I kind of place this outside of martial arts is mm. um, as a laughing Taoist who is not convinced he's a Taoist. Um, I believe the trap is thinking that one side is right. Agreed. It's kind of like the trap that we currently exist in global ideologies. Sure. We think one side has to win or one side must be right. Both sides can actually have elements of them that are right, and both sides can have elements that are wrong. Mm. And, and I think when you approach martial arts or combat sports in that same way, it's like if, if we had never created a sport form of submission or grappling, in which I will call the jujitsu, mm-hmm. if that had never been but created what would have been lost is the exploration that enabled uh, the art off mat out of the match to explore a lahiva guard um spider guard inverted guard all these other things that would have never evolved if you were being punched in the face Mm -hmm. if you were only worried about Will I be punched? We would have missed all kinds of wonderful aspects of grappling. That in wrestling, what, what collegiate wrestling preserves the art of being the guy on top. Greco has rules that, that you can't but grab at the knees or ankles, right? Mm-hmm. Those rules preserve the upright art. Otherwise, you would just go, oh, he can't hit me anymore. So why, why hold my hands up at all? I'm going to drop them. I'm going to lower my waist, and I'm going to grab it, ankles and legs. And then when that guy enters a ring, he can't box. Because he, he, he has lost that feeling of the upright hand-to-hand combat. He's all hunched over from either sport, but jujitsu or collegiate wrestling. Well, and who's to say what's right anyway? Like that's the whole thing that drives me nuts is, you know, because like you said, the exploration, when you create limitations with the rules, you allow for a lot of creativity to flourish, right? It's the way that it works. I mean, any game is, is, has rules and it's within those confines of those rules that we can explore and really do something worthwhile to, to do. But also when people get into like, what's a, a right and wrong, right and wrong are sub- very subjective in most cases, right? Because in very, yeah, yes, yes. And it's like, I'm going to back this up because I think this is, a perfect example if I can somehow get this screen to actually see me <laughs> it's gonna shoot. I'm so if I'm over here and I've been wrestling and I'm in this low thing I enter my legit competition and all is fine I'm low he can't grab me and all this and then I end up in a brawl my instinct, even if I think, oh, if I really fight, I'm going to hold my hands up, I will fight how I train. Mm. And if I always am here as I train, that is how, when I panic, I will but default into what is the most comfortable, mm-hmm. and that would be this. Mm. And then I'm being hit, it hit, 
I would stick my ass out even more, bend my head down, and I'd reach and paw at the legs. And then I would get hit on the head. Whereas like the Greco, the Judo, even though it allows no striking, because it, it's all upright, it is a more natural the transition into the a clinching aspect of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm. But then because in those sports, they allow no grabs at the legs, they walk out upright, macaque, boom, the ankle pick nails. Mm. And all of these things are wonderful. All these sports are great because each of them speciize and specialize and speciate into the, their own thing. It's like what all of us in the combat sports are like large cats. There's the lion, the cheetah, the puma, the tiger. Um, none of them is the best. They all have an area of expertise in the hunt. And the beauty of the Asian styles is the metaphor historical aspect of all of the animal styles, right? You got the monkey style, the China style, the cobra style. I mean, all that stuff is kind of cool and interesting. I don't want to waste my short little life learning non-effective, well, combat skills, but as an entertaining thing, I want to watch Masters of the Flying Guillotine, mm. not too some highly skilled legits guys or wrestlers locked up in a long but boring clinch right sure right so we, we have the entertainment aspect of this whole thing as well and that is where i used to say although now as i've aged i don't care <laughs> is what kills martial arts is trying to put a butts in seats Mm. It's trying to make it something that's a spectator thing, whether it's Hollywood or in the ring or the cage, it's trying to get the non martial artists and our teammates to find interest in watching it. And that is the job of the, the promoter. Mm -hmm. mm. So, I used to care about that. It would piss me off, right? They change but the rules because it's boring and the crowd finds it well, boring. And, and in UFC three or four, when the match would go on for 30 minutes and n nothing is happening, people left the room. And then they said, oh, we got to add rounds because that puts the butt in the seat. And if you're a grappler, you hated that because then the rounds change with the game because mm -hmm. then it means you have to learn just enough a grappling skill to survive on the ground and or stand back up. And, and a few of those, the round's over and it starts again. The a grappler got screwed. But then one could also say that in the reality of the street, that it is far more realistic to train for a three minute MMA round than a 10 minute grappling match. Mm -hmm. Because in the street, it's far more likely that you will have something closer but to one MMA round. One cold start out of the gate, nerves in your belly ding ding mm -hmm. one mma round is probably a more accurate so i don't know right yeah yeah i remember that what was it ufc three was that the one or one of those early ufcs where ken fought hoist was that four yes. and the fight went on forever and they you know they eventually stood up i think ken hit him with one shot in the whole fight and then they were in the guard pretty much the whole time i think that was the one where the pay-per-view cut off, right? Like one of those ones where the pay-per-view cut off and yeah, then yeah. It, it, because it lasted yes. so long because they, they didn't actually book enough time for it. And then after that, like you said, they added yeah. the rounds in later on. Yeah. Well, it's got to be right. digestible, you know, for people. They have to – I think when you're trying to – if you want to make money off of it or if you want to make 
some yeah. kind of livelihood out of it to attract people to attract maybe some of these athletes and some of these people that are, um, you know, may never see this sport or see this martial art. I think it's necessary in a way, but there's got to be, like you said, it's a continuum. How do we keep yes. it true to what it's supposed to be, but also entertaining to the masses? So I right. mean, they did that with judo, right? Like with judo, right. they, I remember um, talking to uh, Neil Adams and he was talking about back in the eighties when he was competing in the Olympics, he was, um, you know, talking about the, all the Sambo guys were coming over from, you know, the Eastern Bloc and they're basically using like unorthodox grips. They were using like <laughs> fireman's carries and shots. And then afterwards, all the judo guys got together and says, well, we're not using, these grips are no longer legal. You can't. And then eventually they took away, like there was a guy named Paula Nastulia. He would just, yeah. he, he had a beautiful double leg essentially. Uh -huh. And then they got rid of the double legs and they were like, you can't, like, you can't even double hand grip break anymore. I don't believe like you have to either, you basically, yeah. they, want, they want you to throw. Right, right. Is yes. That and, and if it was just to preserve the art, I can understand it more. I'm not saying I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. But if the reason of having those rules is to preserve the art of the upright throw, then I can understand it. But if it's because we want to entertain the audience, I'm not interested. Chris, is there like, as far as jujitsu specifically, do you think there's, there's no perfect rule set, obviously, but is there a rule set that you think maybe, um, you know, cause you have the submission only rule sets, you have, you know, the kind of the EBI rules. Is there a rule set that you think kind of best uh, in your opinion encapsulates what jujitsu is? Well, um, I'm going to sound arrogant and snobbish here. <laughs> All right. There was a time about 15 years ago, before Metamorris EBI, when IBJ Bajef was the only game in town, or Abu Dhabi, and whenever I instructed, I would often give a speech that if I was the god of the grappling arts, and I could make up uh, the rules of competition. I would have three specific kinds. And the first one, which would be, and I used to say, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but I will still anyways repeat my speech that I've given a thousand times, is the only belt that really matters is black belt. There are never going to be the Olympic blue belt world champion. <laughs> and the reason why IBJ, the JF, which is a private, highly profitable thing, mm -hmm. is going to stop the Olympics is because there's no money in it. Right. And the only belt that matters is black belt. Everything else is practiced to black belt. In every other combat sport, even if it has no actual belt, it's expert adult the division. Mm -hmm. The blue belt, the purple belt, the kids division, the old guy division, which I'm in now, that doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> we were just having <laughs> we this, had this conversation. conversation. He was, because he was, I just, you know, won a tournament. He was like, we were just getting into it. I'm like, man, I'm in the master's division. It's fun for me. But it doesn't mean anything. It's like the adult of it, the adult <laughs> black belt division. That is the one that matters. It's like the the uh, all the old guys. We're just having fun, man. We're just having a good time. But it, it matters to it me. Matters. I, it matters to me, but it doesn't matter to anyone else. <laughs> like they're not going to have me on the cover of Flow Grappling for winning the Masters, you know, pans or whatever. But you know what I mean. If I had won the adult, you would be there. So it doesn't matter in the grand scheme. So yeah. uh, I agree a hundred percent. Exactly, and we have. Once you're out of the adult division, you have more fun in this art. You aren't wrapped as tight anymore. <laughs> and it's, you, you hug your opponent more. It, it, it's, it's way more enjoyable, right? It um, is, really, it is. Well, the stakes aren't, I guess the stakes aren't as high. Um, uh, what Chu and I were talking about was I think there's still so much I think it, it does have so much value and importance. And to me, you know, I think it, obviously it's not the adult division, but I do feel um, 
there is a lot of value. But there's a value importance to the people that you know. But like, for instance, like, you know, the adult guys that are killing it on the adult level, Absolutely. you don't know many guys in the random masters divisions killing I, it, right? I understand. Well, yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some guys, but I, I do, I get, I get what you're saying. And well, again, I would say, and that's all w what we want to pay attention to, right? Mm -hmm. In the marketplace of ideas that goes through the companies that are allowed to expose the ideas, whether we want to call that media, social media, and it's also what we want to see. Why does Kim McCard Badashian, who's done nothing, have any relevance? Because we give it to her. Sure. And we give the adult division relevance. And we can explain why, because we all know, especially all of us in this chat and probably anyone hearing this who uh, uh, competes, we know that if you removed all of the rules, all of the age groups, the one that matters, the same guys who are on the adult division black belt a podium are going to be the same guys there, even if you removed all of the rules. Right. Yeah. So we, we know that these rules, dividing us in groups, is used to uh, create more fun for mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And if you're a guy who owns the venue, it also creates more money for uh, competitors, which again goes back to the point of why I say this will not become an Olympic sport until, until it becomes a high school American sport. Mm. And then within eight years, it will become an Olympic sport because the jujitsu season will start when wrestling season ends and Americans within four years will rule IBJ, a JF and create an Olympic sport. And that's just my opinion. Now here's and, a, here's a question for you as far as Olympic sport, what do you think about that? Like for me, like when I think about like, for instance, with like judo and you look at all the different, um, adept, like if you watch, go watch like old judo matches from like when they first got into the Olympics to now and how much it's changed judo, over time, yeah. you know, it's like, so my, my, one of the things that I always kind of worried about, like when people have asked me and say, well, Chew, you, what do you think about jujitsu being in the Olympics? The one thing that I always got kind of worried about is that if you had only one governing body that gave you one option, then again, it would limit the the types of matches because then we would start to probably become have a more cauterized version of jiu-jitsu where you know we have these throws these takedowns these things these things these are the basic rule set that we follow so this is all we're focused on so we're no longer focused on these other uh, skill sets or these other sort of um different types of formats like an ebi or something or whatever yep. it might be you know so um what I do you think about that completely agree but completely agree and that's why again as i was, was speaking earlier I don't want one side to win in anything because then you have authoritarianism. And when there's one the judo organization, one the jujitsu thing, when the Don King owns boxing, whatever it is, we, we all know, us three know for sure, 100%, the reason why we are good is because our gyms are filled with competition. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody who is crawling at your back, who is just this much under you. And there's somebody who is this much above you. And that's what keeps us honest. And the best thing ever is when there's multiple venues. The worst thing ever is when one guy controls the whole thing. Mark Zuckerberg. Mm. That's why it sucks. Because all of us, whether you're on the left or the right or whatever it is, we all detect when something is stale because it's owned by one dominant thing. We can feel it. Anyone who has half of a brain knows 
oh, I, I don't have a choice anymore. Mm. I can only buy this a product. I can only uh, compete under these rules. I can only whatever it is. Or w when the other guy gets so, so huge, they have the power to repress a competition. IBJ, JF, UFC. They either repress it or buy it. Yeah. Monopolies. And it, yeah. And th that makes sense. You know, you're, if, if the Olympics is the gold standard, then everything is going to kind of go towards that. It's not going to really be conducive to having all this creativity, all these variations, these different submissions or, or even tactics or strategies, which sometimes, you know, in an EBI, some, some athletes have the strategy of just going to the overtime and just doing the overtime uh, portion of, um, so it does exactly. And even, you know, even having that sort of like just the overtime format, you've seen all kinds of creativity just in those, you know, you know, taking the back or just starting from the back position. So you, you realize that even yep. though different strategies do um, produce some kind of creativity and evolution and kind of where we've gotten to from when you started, which was, uh, you know, how many, 20, 30 years ago? How long have you been training? I'm training it. But jujitsu, I started in 1988. So, 88. Yeah. so yeah, I mean, so you've seen and then, this. Yes. And then <laughs> I used to say again in my speeches, so I would create three rule sets and I would have as the athletes walked out, coaches would roll a die and whoever whatever number it added up would be on a chart and go, ding, that's the rule set, slap hands and start. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, 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 because I think what, what, what makes martial arts in the purest realm so fun is it's, it's the unpredictable chaos. Mm -hmm. It's the game of creating order out of chaos. And in sports, because our goal is we want to win, we will figure out how to win within the man-made rules of the game, pushing the boundaries of the rules as far as we can, mm -hmm. and the, we will only stop if we're punished, yeah. either by removal of a point or whatever it is. That's the same thing within the sport of politics. One will only stop if they are punished. And if there's no but punishment, one will cheat. That's oh, yeah. tyranny. Right? And that, and whether you want to call it left or right and all that, I don't care. But it, it's recognizing what is tyranny. It is the absence of the agreement of rules amongst men. But in the martial arts, we can play a game where we get to throw the rules out or limit the rules. That's why if I was a grappling king, the rule I would make before I became a tyrant would be I would have random rules in which the athletes were completely unaware. And then when I became a tyrant, that... 12 by 12 mat I would bring up and you would fall into spikes of <laughs> a pikeman if you lost <laughs> if you rolled off of the edge <laughs> I would completely change everything and we would be Rome again right no I wouldn't do that at least I hope not yeah but like um <laughs> if you want to hear a really interesting a podcast um it's um, the Dan, um, Dan, he, he does um, hard uh, core history podcast. Yeah, Dan Carlin. Um, he does a great one on the ancient Roman games is like half of it and the religious stuff and all that. And if you want to go back into pure combat sports, that's <laughs> the era. And I used to say years ago as well, and often do, 
What's changed martial arts is not only the advancement of our ethics and culture, mm -hmm. but this screen that we are on. That's what's changed it. Because now live time history is recorded. I'm sure the ancient Romans and Greeks and many other well, cultures came up with the best way of how two arms, but two legs can control and make the other guy quit to a point of it was life or death. Sure. And I'm sure that much of what we think is new now, they knew 2000 years ago. It just was never recorded. Absolutely. I've, I've like dug up and found some stuff uh, where they would have these old manuals like from like the, you know, 1400s or something where, you know, they would draw, depict knights fighting in armor. And, uh, you know, they, they show in movies where they're swiping with swords, but actually there was a lot of grappling involved because you, these guys were tanks essentially, and you might like get them down to the ground and then you might stab them in a weaker part, right? Because if you try to sling a sword against the arm, it's just not going to necessarily work. But they were showing all these right. different moves where essentially like there were these grappling techniques and you're seeing like these joint locks and stuff to mm -hmm. render them uh, in with mm -hmm. control. And then, you know, you can even go back and look at all the different wrestling formats that have been around for thousands of years and the pictures yeah. of it. And you're like, and like you said, if it was life and death, you're going to find a really good way of doing it. We just wrote the stuff down and put it into more of a systemized, uh, systematized form that could be distributed more widely, you know, and, like you, and that's it. Here's a great little story. Um, so back when I was a, a purple belt, um, one of my friends, because I was, you know, one of those nerds that read Lord of the Rings, played Dungeons and Dragons, but growing up. I was one and, of those nerds, yeah. <laughs> and one of my friends was in the <clears throat> Society of Historical Reenactment, which are with the guys who make armor. And yeah, they, yeah. Wear the things. And he's like, oh, you would love this. And I'd done... Macaulay and fencing and I'm a purple belt at the time and also I'm like oh yeah I would love it and so but they armored me up and one guy's like you could tell I'm watching he's pretty good he's winning and all that and he's got this big wooden shield and when, when he walks over to me he's like holding it and he's like hitting over the shield like this and I saw the shield just seemed to me that's a kicking shield mm. he's holding up a kicking shield so I just planted my perfect Shotokan side thrust kick right at the shield, and he knocked him down in his armor, and he rolled down by the hill. They were so fucking mad at me. <laughs> You're Guys ruined. running out, you can't hit, you can't kick. And, of course, I'm a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu purple belt, and I'm like, there aren't any rules you you, you right. know you, you can't remove my one skills if i want to grapple if i want to kick if he can hit me with that club i can hit him with my foot yeah chris now nowadays that's called uh larping i think isn't it larping live action role larping playing? yeah yeah <laughs> live action role playing yeah it's funny you were talking about like people like pressing the rules just, and finding the boundaries it's a of lot things. Of things now. Yeah. The, uh, I remember teaching kids classes where, you know, I would come up with a game that would have like some sort of like, like jujitsu centered, like reason for playing the game. And then, you know, I would give the kids the rules and then, you know, you let them play and you realize how human it is to sort of press the boundaries because what would happen is, is the kids would start playing and you'd yes. see, you see the wheels turning. Uh -huh. And then before you know it, the, some of the kids would like start to what I would consider cheating, but I had never explicitly laid out that rule. So, you know, I would say, Hey, that you can't do that. And they're like, well, you didn't say you couldn't. So, you know, so then you got to put in all these new rules to like try to keep them contained so that they're not like you yep. said, cause, and they'll figure out a new way to do things because they're just like, well, like I'm going to push the boundaries yeah. and everything else. And I think and that's, that's a, the art of politics, right? Yeah. I, I think that's a actually a great point. And like even having certain rule sets allows you to be more creative because now you're in like the smaller <clears throat> container. And there's less yes. things you can do. So you have to find more creative avenues, more creative ways to do these things that um, just because you're Here's so limited. Box. Exactly. Here's the box. And long before EBI, and I almost think that Eddie – 
got this from overhearing me, but I don't know because my <laughs> ego wants, I want the credit. But I used to say all the time, if you want to fix sport, but you, but jitsu, make it more of a street reality or MMA thing, you would have to change it. And I could only change one rule. If I was allowed, I could only change one rule. It would be everyone was allowed one open hand, a strike every match. Utilize whenever you want or not at all, but you only get one. Mm. And, and I used to say, watch, not multiple. Don't make it a slap fight. Don't make it a pancreation. You just get one. And that would change everything Be because it's, you're changing the rule enough. I think, I don't know because we haven't experimented. You're changing it enough where you keep the structure of the game still, but you would be very wary of that one hit mm. and you wouldn't want to use that hit early on. You would want to save it because you only got one and it would suddenly change the way you spider guarded, the way you mm -hmm. Ayla Heva guarded, how long you would hover in a scramble, how it, it, it would completely, just that one rule would change with the game, I believe. Because you'd have that threat the whole time of possibly getting popped in the face. Threat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it would be interesting watching just as a human experiment, how it played out and at what a point and how we would adapt and push with the rule and use with the rule as a tool but to gain locks and chokes mm -hmm. but because the the the, ju, the jitsu i learned and but back in the olden days and sometimes i don't even know if the old school guys remember this but only the black belts were allowed uh, to hit you, which seems really unfair. But w what it was, was is you had to uh, come up with a grappling solution for a striking problem, not a counter striking solution. You had to learn how when Hickson or Horion is slapping you how to get out. I can't slap him back. I have to learn a, a jujitsu answer. And so when I teach my guys, if you're not involved in the art, it looks like, oh, look how mean coach is. He's slapping the blue belts again. What I'm doing is I'm keeping them honest. Yeah. And then if I want me trained, I let them hit me and I can't hit back. Mm. Because then I have to have a grappling answer. Hmm. And then on rare occasions, we go Valley Chudo, which is both guys hit. Hmm. And that kind of preserves the art, preserves the jujitsu guys game goal and intent is to win by the art against other arts and the strike. And I don't know how realistic that is anymore in modern MMA or any of that stuff. It used but to be that we didn't go no gi until you were seasoned a purple belt. Mm. And that was just how it was. And I thought that was kind of good, but I also understand how it's not good, especially in America. It used to also be that you did a privates until your a private instructor, whether it was Hoist, Hickson, or Hegan, would approve you, to, but to enter the group class mm. and to actually grapple. And um, because they didn't want you learning bad habits or uh, being a spaz. And that was understandable too. But I also understand how in the American opening up a gym won't work in that a model, right? You mm -hmm. have to, because 
we, we want to hop in. And I also understood why back in, I want to say the middle days, but to most people out there that this is the early days still, why people gravitated, especially egotistical and or seasoned combat athletes preferred nogi because not only is nogi is a much simpler game, mm -hmm. but you didn't have to wear a white belt. Mm. You, you, you didn't have to have the image. I'm, I'm uh, the novice because the, the belt structure is a hierarchy. And even if your black belt coach says all the time, the belt you wear doesn't matter. The only people that ever say it and actually believe it are is a black belts. Because of course, everybody's thinking about the next belt. Yeah, of course. You can't not. You can't not. You can really enjoy the belt you're in, but you want the next belt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in wrestling, but boxing, you eliminate that. It's pure meritocracy. And the beauty of the, the, the jiu-jitsu the as an art is it can take someone and slowly change them and groom them into expertise without having to constantly face the meritocracy, which is bad and good, right? Mm. If, but, but if, you know, I hesitate to say this these days because people get so pissed over politics, but the jujitsu, the IBJJF model, that whole thing, that is fascism. Hmm. It's a hierarchical structure based upon the worship of a of who's ever on the top of the triangle of the hierarchy. The um, back alley the boxing gym is libertarianism. A, a, a guy opens up a gym, has lockers, you look for your the champion, you find a guy, my million dollar baby, I opened up a gym, you groom him, you hook him on a contract, he wins some fights, you win money, he burns you, he changes management. That's that pure free market world of the boxing gym in its a, a purest. High school, college wrestling is social democracy. The coach's job is not reliant on whether he wins or loses. He's hired by the school, by the state, by the, the country, whoever it is. And the team works itself out within it, its small group, right? And all of these are systems that are good. They all have aspects of them that are good. Mm. They all have an element of them that does one thing really well. Whether it's be fair to all really well or groom the top or balance not having but to worry about income because your wrestling book coach is also the history teacher and he's being paid so he doesn't have to re recruit students or whether it's the I, I i didn't explain it well but you get my point right yeah yeah no i'm following you you know the one thing i was thinking about when you were saying that I was thinking of, um, you know, and this is true, whether it's like, for me, just the feeling of it. I remember being in, you know, jujitsu when I first started. I remember wrestling in high school when I first started. In high school wrestling, everybody knew the pecking order. There was a pecking yeah. order. Everybody knew, you know, you knew who had the, because you, and for some of you guys, if you're listening, if you've never wrestled before, you know, you would have wrestle-offs. Who got to claim the yeah. spot for varsity? Um, yeah. You know, any, any, anybody can, right, anybody can claim Every that, right? 
Every Anyone, week. Yes. You, you always had a guy right under you who wants that spot. Mm-hmm. And then I thought about when I got into jujitsu where I remember very early on where, you know, and I, and this is where I am. I, I've never looked at the belt as necessarily the, it's a, it's a measurement of something, but it's not yeah. necessarily a measurement of, can I kick your butt or not? Because I remember getting into it and I realized very quickly that, you know, as I got better and more technical and um, being in a little bit better shape, I could beat belt, belts that were higher than me. I, I did that fairly often. And you, then you'd go to different gyms sometimes. And some gyms like the blue belts felt like, you know, brown belts. And then sometimes yeah. you go to gyms and the black belts felt like a, a blue belt, you know? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, so then you get into that thing where then it, it always kind of comes back to it, I guess, where, you know, you, you do want the, the next belt. But for me, it was always about, I wanted to be the next step on the pecking order. Right. So right. Like, I, I didn't care what belt I was. I just wanted to be up on that pecking order. Like I was in wrestling, you know? So and that's why you're good because but to you what's important is the the art the game mm. doing it not what you wear not your belt not any of that but as y you know especially in jiu jitsu but more so in other martial arts what you wear your a title becomes more important than your skill. Mm. It, it becomes a thing where, and but to you or other athletes, that seems kind of alien. But I, I know a lot of guys who they really want their black belt. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they'll come to me and, and say, I was under this coach and I got my blue belt and then I was under this coach for a while and I got my purple and then I moved away and blah, blah, blah. And, else. and I've been a, a brown belt now for nine years. I think I need my black belt and stuff hmm. and all. I'm, I'm now in the olden days, it was never acceptable at all to ever ask for a belt. You just did not ask. I mean, that was taboo. If you had asked, I saw guys make the attempt but to ask Hegan before, um, and I know with, with Hickson or him, you do not ask. You do not decide when you are ready for the next belt. And I was expressly told early on, not everybody gets the black belt. It's not a time and grade thing. Mm -hmm. It's not your hours on the map thing. It's you got to earn with the belt. And I have since basically the way I rank now is it's based on a combination of your, how you hold your own against your peer group. Mm -hmm whether that's the non-athletic executive or the athlete, I want to be a world champion. I'm not holding them on the same skill of, well, executive man, if you can't hold your own against former high school wrestling champ, <laughs> now IBJJF, but the blue belt, a bronze medalist. You know, <laughs> that's unrealistic. So it's based on your personal growth. But then if you're but the athlete, then it's all like, oh man, I kicked that guy's butt. Why did he get promoted to brown belt? Because you're not in his the peer group. Mm -hmm. You have another peer group. So, um, um, I always advise all the coaches to have a loose assessment, not a boxed in, but a loose assessment of one's the peer group when you will promote. So what is the maximum potential they have? Don't go early or you'll spoil it. Don't go late or you'll stall it. It's a timing thing of knowing when you've crossed the, that line. Mm. And that line is like, 
the a blue belt line. I, I mean, like the back in the olden days, and I won't mention any names, and I could understand why because of the structure and you're trying to grow the art and all that stuff. If you were Chuck's Kung Fu school and you had in one of the big name um, um, the Brazilians in to come in, instruct a seminar, there was a good chance that when he left, you now had a blue belt on your mm. waist. And that's neither here nor there. And, and again, it goes back to the only belt that really matters is black belt. Everything else is practice. And the other thing I would say, um, um, I got, I had a good point that this was leading to, but I forgot what I was going to say. So, um, oh, it was such a good point about <laughs> the belts and, oh, but it, go ahead. Well, if you remember it, come back to it, but, um, and feel free to just interject if it pops into your head. But one thing I was curious about, cause you know, obviously you've been training for a long time. And, yep. you, you, and you've gone through changes and you've competed, you know, as late as, you know, was it was 2015. Um, yeah. you, World Master 5 how, champion. How do, you tra- how do you, like, how do you train as an older guy? Because I know we have, like, that's one of the things where jiu-jitsu attracts a lot of guys who I feel like, you, you know, they're in their 30s plus and they're looking to sort of recapture some of that warrior energy that they had at some point in their lives or maybe that they never actually had a chance to exploit in their lives what would you say to some of those people that are training jiu-jitsu and they're a little bit older and just what you said where a lot of times I see like the older guys and they'll look at that 20 year old who's biting at the bit that has no responsibilities in their life. They're living at their mom's basement and they're training all the time and they want to try to keep pace with that person when it's a bad idea. Um, But what is your training like now and and slash maybe what kind of advice would you give to like an older grappler that's getting into this um, and maybe something that might be useful to them? Well, the one advice, and years ago, this is now when I was probably a newer well, a black belt, I wrote up a waiver because I was suddenly worried in my garage, where, which is my school, one could say, although I don't have a school, I have a garage, mm. that what happens if a guy gets hurt and injured, I could get sued and all that And I wrote up a lengthy waiver in which you had to write out, not only am I aware that I could get hurt, maimed, but crippled, or even die, but I will for sure sustain injuries, marks, bruises that will affect my life. Hmm. That there is a, and I would make them write it out. So if it ever ended up in court, I am aware that my instructor nor the others can be entirely responsible and watch over all of the training. I am aware that there are guys in here who have no idea what they are doing and could possibly injure or hurt me. And, and I wrote it up in a whole long thing and realized that. If you're willing to do all of that, you're in the right place. Because if you think you'll escape injury or pain, you're in the wrong place. Mm. And that's the first thing I like establishing with anyone, regardless of age. And there are schools that you can join because they need the money and the bodies and all that, and they don't have to deal with that, which goes back again to why wrestling as a public sport is good because they don't have to deal with worrying about having students. Mm. You get them. Um, so I kind of have that as a, a model. And then I tell older guys, especially as now I am one who's got knee injuries and neck injuries and back injuries, my wrists hurt and my fingers hurt and everything hurts is that, This isn't, don't worry about winning. Worry about having fun. And if you have fun, you will learn and enjoy yourself. Because you don't have to convince yourself of the goal of winning. That's natural. We all have that. 
We yeah. all want to win. I don't have to pump myself up like, oh, I got to win. Instead, I got to do the opposite. Oh, I'm here to have fun. I'm here to enjoy myself. And I do the same thing in competition. Even if I'm nervous, I say, I am here just to have a good time. I want to play my game, which is one of the reasons why after my last IBJ, the JF match, and I had a long lunch with Hickson afterwards and discussed in the stupid five minute matches for old guys. <laughs> with, with well, I mean, I can understand maybe old but blue belts, but old yeah. black belts should not have such a sprint. <clears throat> but give us 10 minutes. Let us warm up. It's insulting. A five minute match. Well, in the five minute match, like I like, I'll say this, I like to some degree, I like a, a shorter match around a six to seven minute mark. Um, for me, like a five minute match turns into where like it's so long that people maybe either don't do anything the first half or the second, they, you know, whatever. But that said, I think a five minute match is just so short. I mean, you make one mistake. And then, especially yeah. if it's a point-based tournament, like I watched, yeah. um, I watched several matches. It was I was at the Pans some years ago, and you would watch it, and it was in the older divisions. I was watching the guys, and as soon as the guy was up a point, the rest of the match he would just kind of skirt the edge, and he yep. wouldn't he wouldn't engage. And yep. you know, again, it's it's just one of those things that's super frustrating. I if I could, you know, if, if I if I could it's change smart. some of the, well, it's I wish I the one thing I wish that jujitsu was a little bit more strict on which wrestling is like if wrestling, if you start backing up, they start stalling. You call real yes. quick. I real wish jujitsu was more aggressive with stalling calls to make people engage. I agree. Mm. I agree. And which is why after that match, I made up my mind that I'm all done with IBJJF competition mm. until they change the rules. I'm done. And I kind of realized I, I, I felt old. I stood up, you know, I, it, it hurt. And it's like now I'm at an age where I always but tell everyone just because I like the drama of this. It's like when you look at the African plains and you see an old lion who can barely walk and you're like, how is that lying around still? It's because all the young ones know he's got one good one left in him. <laughs> Only one. But he's, <laughs> but he's got it, though. And that's like, I'm kind of at the mode now where I love rolling still. And I know, at least r right now, I've got one real one left in me. Where I can arch my back and twist my body and roll out of stuff and scramble like I'm young again, but I only got one of those. And that one I'm going to save. But as we all know, it's a perishable skill. Mm. And the micro timing only comes when you're engaged in it all, all of the time. The guys who know of all the combat sports, the one that, that is so key and critical in timing is boxing, the pure boxing. Mm -hmm. And it's so much about, that is the science, is timing. And that's the first thing you lose when you stop training. But kind of like your lungs are the first thing, but that goes, but it comes back fast, right? It's like if you, you get the COVID and you're out a month or whatever it is, your cardiovascular capacity, lung capacity, all that stuff just plummets really fast. Within like three days, you, you lose cardio, but it comes back quick too. Mm -hmm. But timing is more of a weirder thing where it goes slowly down and then it drops and when it becomes back it comes back slowly and then one day it clicks again mm. in timing um so 
as an older martial artist, if you concentrate on timing, you make that your main goal as a grappler. Um, so if you're playing racquetball, you can no longer hustle all over the court. It's about placing the ball where you don't have but to work and your opponent does. And then comes in the pressure game. And what my wife will, always goes when I, when her and I roll and my wife's really good. Is she's like, God, you're boring because I'll stall a lot. <laughs> because I don't want to, because if I end up in the rapid scramble game with her, I, I can lose that exchange. Right? It's like, I remember being probably 41 or two and overhearing on a mat how fast a, a guy was. And it was no longer me who they were talking about. <laughs> and that's like one of those humbling things because I was always known as I was fast. I was quick. And I can't match the young guys on speed. Mm -hmm. So I have to match them on timing and guile. Mm. And eventually all those go and we die. And in 75 billion years, the sun will swallow up the earth and we're all dead. So lean in. You got this short life. Long compared but to a fly, short compared to a star, and this is what you got. So what do you, you got but to lose? Don't get hurt. Show up. Grapple to have fun, not but to win, and you will grow in this art and love it. Chris, what about like attribute? So you talked about attribute, possibly timing for the older guys. If you had yeah. to maybe say a younger, you know, 20 something adult black belt, what do you, if you had to create like your perfect grappler per se, what's the one attribute that you think is the most vital? For what venue? Okay. Let's just say I, IBJJF, you know, for. Here's an example. Let's just say IBJ, but JF calls up but Chris Howder and goes, Hey, Chris Howder, we're going to give you a random number of 10 blue belts, young guys, athletes, you, you train these guys, you have, whether I have a year or whether I have a month or whether I have five years will, but depend on how I'm going to train them for the big competition. And if all I have is a month, it's going to be, a cardio, whatever move they like, we do it over and over and over again. They find a way but to get their move no matter what. And that is what I would harp on. If I had five years and then we had the big competition, I would spend the first year, they wouldn't be allowed to do their favorite move at all. I would eliminate it. And we would work on wherever, but they're weak. And we would build the weakness and, and then reintroduce, but their strength. And so, and so it kind of all but depends. It's like, as a coach, you've got the big picture and you've got the short one. You've got next month's book competition, the blue belt. And where do you want to be if you want to be a black belt champion? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of, but depends. But in general, I advise, what's the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of that quote. It's a, uh, but you approach it, you practice it like a science, but you think of it as an art. It's, um, God, what is that quote? It's, it, it's one of my favorite quotes. I'm going to look it up right now. 
if I can find it. Well, anyways, just forget it. I don't want to be on my phone. <laughs> um, Chris, if um, just so like people, you know, we have a lot of listeners sometimes that are newer, newer to jujitsu. Can you give us like a visual of like when you first walked in, maybe it was the garage, you know, the, what was and that? What, was what, what did you see? And what did it do to your mind? We're like, what, what went through your head? And you're like, holy shit, this is incredible. Like, what was it for you that, that you've done now for 30 years? Like, what was it about jujitsu for you? What it was, as a guy who had, who had already done some boxing, high school wrestling, karate, kung fu, and brawled a lot. What, what jiu-jitsu was, was kind of like the art that you were always looking for, that you were always after. It, 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 it was wrestling, but free. It, it, without the uh, confines, it was like um, the dream of what you would acquire from a, a karate, but you knew wasn't really there. Suddenly you saw, oh, this is here and it works. Mm -hmm. um, it was like magic, honestly. It was like... Um, I mean, I know people experience it now still, but before you had even seen it at all, there was the effortless skill in which the novice was controlled by the expert was so stark and real that if you had any brains, you instantly were hooked. If you had a stubbornness or an ego or were offended because of the Gracie challenge, those guys went off to try to come up with a way to beat the jujitsu. And that was kind of how it was. Mm -hmm. What was it like training with, uh, cause I mean, like when I first started back in 2003, I remember there was like this, this sort of uh -huh. mystical aura around Hickson, right? Like you would just, you would just read these stories about it. And there was always this, just, you know, everybody would talk about rolling with them. Like it was just the most incredible thing ever. Um, you know, and being kind of like one of the most, like sort of, uh, one of the combat champions of the family. What was it like? <laughs> what was it like training with him? Hickson, um, I trained with Hickson in white and blue belt, and then I did not train with Hickson at all until just a few years ago. And so I, 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 you could say that, like, the thing about Hickson, and I'll tell you guys, um, is out of all the – but Gracie's, Machado's, other guys. Hickson made the Gracie myth a reality. Mm. Where you could call the other ones great athletes, great martial artists. You could say they competed more. You could say they, whatever it was. But with Hickson, especially in Hickson's prime, It was, it, it, you felt like you were meeting a 16th century samurai warrior mm. in spirit. You, 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 you felt like whether he could lose or not, you felt like even if he was losing mentally, he would never lose. Mentally, he would be problem solving his way out of whatever combat a problem he was in. Whereas with the other guys, even like Randy Bocoteur in the early days when I dreamt them and all those guys, they've competed. They know they can win. They know they can lose. 
Hickson could not lose. Even if he did lose, he could not lose. Hmm. And that's, and not in an arrogant way. It, 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 it wasn't a cocky thing. It, it, was a, it was a pure warrior spirit. And it's, it, it's one of those rare things that, that you can experience with teams of operators. They know they can lose. They, they, you're but training but to not lose. But there's part of your spirit that gives itself to relentless the defeat of your opponent. Mm. And it's that relentlessness in the art, coupled with his athletic skill and the hierarchy of the of Gracie structure that he had no choice. He was the guy. Hmm. And, um, and then I will say, as Hickson's aged and now, see, a lot of times like a, a blue belt, a purple belt, they can like watch Hickson show an arm bar or a sweep and be like, yeah, uh, this move I know. And even when I like watch it on the screen a lot, you have to feel it. You can't see Hickson. You, you feel Hickson. And H H Hickson's like would change like just the way I hold my hand. Like, no, relax that. Move this right there. Okay. Now, but connect. You see Chris? Yes. But connect on your bod. Yes. More hip. No, no, no. You know, slap. Like, no, no. <laughs> yes. And it's micro adjusting, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like the blue belt. If we compare this but to but, but drawing a face, the white belt walks in draws a circle, two dots, a dot for a nose and a line. I drew my face. The blue belt comes in, he adds ears, he adds some eyebrows. Oh, I can make expressions. And, and on and on, a black belt paints a face in a dimension. And Hickson comes up and he's Rembrandt. And he just knocks it, right? It's like, wow, I thought I could paint. <laughs> And so that's kind of, and, you know, I don't want to place him on some huge uh, pedestal because there's a lot of, especially the modern jiu-jitsu that Hickson probably doesn't even know. Sure. But the foundational, fundamental, structural, as I call the structure of, of, of the foundations of jiu-jitsu which I call the 18, 3, 6, 9, 18 fundamental aspects of the art. The triangle goes this way with 18, that way with 18, and that way. The guard passing, the defending, the back attack, the knee ride, the clinch, the entry, all this stuff in the 18 fundamentals of if I have to take two untrained guys and in one year throw you in a pit and one of you leaves alive, how am I going to train you? It is through these 18 things. Mm. If I have to enter you in an IBJJF thing, you can win some, you can lose some, it's this. Mm. If you have to win in who throws who, it's Greco or Judo. If, he, if it's, but if I'm going to throw you in a pit where there are no rules, I teach basically Hickson style with Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing that anytime you come across like a, uh, um, you know, a guy who's been involved in the art for such a long time, like you said, you think you know something, 
and then they'll come up and they'll make a small adjustment. You know, I've had that happen plenty of times where, you know, oh, well, just move your hand like an inch up and then turn it like just a, about a quarter inch this way, and then boom, it changes everything. It, it's it's always neat to see that where, you know, especially because people go down different rabbit holes, right? So yeah. like some, some people really fleshed out this whole side of it, whereas yes. this person fleshed out this. So you, you find this person and he just knows all this stuff. And you're right, you, a lot of times you can see it, but until you felt it, you really, you, have to. you don't know. You don't know. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. There's, there's levels. It's like <laughs> last thing I'll add, and this will magnify what the point is like, I really enjoy watching MMA. Mm -hmm. I don't watch it with any audio. I turn all the audio off because <laughs> I don't want to hear any commenting. <clears throat> because I'm watching it as an art. O oftentimes, maybe this is screwed up of me. I don't even know the names of the guys but competing because that's not why I'm watching it. I'm watching it for but the art. And in the early days, and I hate watching it around non a combat a, a sports. Yeah. 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 I hate it. Because they'll, they don't understand why a guy isn't just kneeing him or punching him in a clinch. Right. But until you felt the load of weight on your hip and know if I move my foot, I'm going to fall or whatever it is, you can't because it looks like you would just be able to push the guy off of the clinch or come over and hit him or punch him in the face or mm -hmm. or – escape out of the guard or open up his his ankles with on that are crossed and i remember when i was a fairly new well, black belt i wish i knew his name he was an arizona state college wrestler around my weight class and he finally showed me a proper leg ride and i had always been kind of I had emphasized the wrong aspects of the leg ride. Um, if you looked at it, it looked like a leg ride, but it didn't feel like a leg ride. And he showed me how to leg ride. And it just changed my entire game. Mm. Hmm. Changed my back attack, changed everything. Because I now knew how, and I thought I learned it, in high school from a coach who was a leg ride master as a coach. But for some reason, I, in high school, I couldn't get the leg ride. I would fall off. I'd get hip bumped. I, it, it was just, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I think, and I think that's the beautiful part about combat sports in general is because it's such a feelings base, like where, you know, I've over the years had guys come in where let's say they, they looked at the grappling thing and they kind of scoffed at it and then you would put them on the mat and then they realized when you, they couldn't get out of it. Like, I mean, we would have guys come in way back in the day when our gym was first being kind of coming across and, you know, I'd I had guys come in and say, oh, that, that, you know, whatever they would kind of make a comment and say, oh, here's what, here's what's going to happen. I'll pay you 20 bucks if you can get me on a mount. Um, you know, whatever, I'll give you 20 bucks if you can keep me down there. And uh, I remember we had guys that said that they wanted to fight MMA or something and, you know, or whatever, you know, you'd put them in the, they, they would, they would insist that they had sparred. So you put them in with someone that just jab drills them a little bit, just a little jab, nothing crazy. Yep. And they realized that in a one minute tops, they were exhausted and getting ready to puke. And then they felt it. And then that kind of created the, the fork in the road where they're either like, I've got to do this or this is definitely not for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's kind of like, uh, I'm going to bring up this one image just to show it because it kind of explains it exactly. By the way, I looked up a quote when on my phone earlier, and I don't know if this is the one. It says, first study the science, then practice the art, which is born of the science. I don't know if that that's a one. great one. It, so, that wasn't the one I was at. Okay. It, it's um, Ryan Hall's quote. Okay. He has a great one. Um, I wish I'd thought of it. 
Ryan Hall has a really a good quote on it. I, I'm going to find you this one thing we can talk while you're doing this. These, the blessing and the curse of the phone, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the, it's like it's there. We we don't have a we don't have a Jamie, right? We don't have a guy that just looks stuff up for us. I'm, um, the, I'm the Jamie. You're the Jamie, right? I'm the Jamie um, and the co-host and all the. Um, like I say, and I'll, I'll make this my final quote, and then I'm signing out. All right. It is, I do the, the jujitsu because I can't not do the jujitsu. And that's the only reason why I do jujitsu. I like it. Awesome. That's awesome. Chris, uh, quickly, your uh, if is your Oh, I'm gym... supposed to promote stuff. Yes. Your uh, gym is combatbase.com. Right? Combat... Gym. It's, it's a garage. His garage. My garage, <laughs> but I offer, we, we offer because we, we offer instructionals. There's a, a, a club you join and you can watch videos of me explaining stuff, ask what questions and I'll explain it because of Zoom right now and all that. It's all online. Um, um, if I can ask you guys one thing, um, the combat-based YouTube a channel just click subscribe and like and even if you never look at the channel again it helps me that i have likes and subscribers i hate being one of those the please get like and subscribe in the below corner <laughs> but yes please hit like and subscribe <laughs> combat based youtube channel a combat based club look it up um but buy gear uh christmas is just around the corner Support my lifestyle, become a Patreon, give me money. I hate that part, right? God, to beg for money. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I, if, you, if you provide something and people want to reciprocate, then it's just you're doing a dance. Yes. And that's like, uh, there was a few years back where, but privates, I mm -hmm. don't do for good money because, yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a... I have knowledge mm -hmm. and I can fix your a broken game, mm -hmm. but it's going to cost me energy, time, and money. I mean, and my body. And if I'm going to fix your a broken game, that is value. That's gold. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's knowledge that you cannot not experience if you want to advance. And you need that one-on-one -on -one connection mm -hmm. so I can micro-adjust you. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much, man. You, right, you've, got, you've got so much... Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Really, uh, it's an honor to have you on. And, and thanks for, you know... Everything you've done for jujitsu, being one of the first 12 black belts, American black belts, correct? Yep. I was one of them. Awesome. Maybe one day I'll get a red belt. Maybe. How long does that take usually? <laughs> well, supposedly. 30 plus I'm, years. Supposedly I'm six years away for a lacrosse belt, but that's all politics. Yeah. <laughs> that's all politics. <laughs> well, thanks for your time, man. All right, you guys. Take care. Appreciate you, Chris. Bye-bye. Yep. Out. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Hope you got something from it. If you're, uh, you know, if you're an older guy, maybe you got something from his sort of his ideas as being an older grappler. Maybe you're just someone that's in jujitsu, and you, maybe his sort of philosophical spin maybe gave you something to think about. For me, I find it refreshing to talk to, as I said earlier on the show, an older school guy that has a balanced view of things. You know, from everything from you know, the sport to the fighting aspect to everything. Because, again, I, I, I very much dislike when people draw extremes and then make you pick a side. Like, you've got to be on this side or that side. Because I tend to think that a lot of times when people do that, they're doing that as a mechanism for uh, controlling yeah. control mm -hmm. and controlling your thoughts or um, and making you sort of have to subscribe to their ideology rather than being free to do whatever it is that you wish to do. Yeah. Um, He's got such a great, uh, a unique perspective on jujitsu, and uh, he's got so much knowledge. He's been through so many, like, I don't know, like, 
generations of jujitsu almost. Like you can think of these generations. He's probably like the very first generation of jujitsu in America. Um, yeah, yeah, in America for sure. Um, you know, like just literally like the stuff you see, like those Gracie, you know, the stuff they did in in, yep. in their garages. He was probably I think he was there and saw that and he was a part of that in some way. I, mean, I don't know if he competed or anything like that, but. You got to see that firsthand. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about that. Like, it's uh, it's something that the the younger crowd will never be able to. And by younger, I just mean people that are newer to jujitsu, that'll never be able to fully appreciate or experience, um, mm-hmm. because of social media and stuff. Like, for instance, I mean, like me, like I mean, I I remember, like, dude, we, we even back in the day in two thousand three, it was still a very underground thing. Yes, you there were no like web the Google wasn't what it is now. It was hard to find stuff. I remember f- like f- searching for hours to find a jiu jitsu school, and found one on some back page of the internet, and uh, it was like on BJJ.org back in the day. Yeah, and uh, you know contacted the guy through AOL Instant Messenger. And started training with them. And back then, I mean, we would have people come in all the time who just wanted to see what they had. You know, yeah. Let me challenge yeah. you guys. You know, we'd have bodybuilders, we'd have like other fighters, and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, now it's like you can't really do that. And um, in the same manner, and you know, even with like everything from like just the pervasiveness of social media, where everybody wants to post about everything, to even the um, political correctness. So, I mean, you just can't do some of the stuff that back we did back in the day in the old school days. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, it just it wouldn't have been. I mean, even if you look at the Gracie and action tapes, that wouldn't fly today. Slapping people around. People would be like, oh, my God, why are they hurting them? You know, and I mean, I get messages all the time where people will say, well, like, because people I'll say if like someone's if someone's being a mean person, like a guy's being a jerk or something, then you put them in line physically. Doesn't mean you're being mean to them. Doesn't mean you're hurting them. You do it from a situation where I want to make you better and you've got to fall in line. And I, I speak from experience. As a guy, lots of guys need to be kind of checked. Like, right? Like, it's, it, and they need to be physically checked. Yeah. Guys are very much a physical thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you can tell guys, hey, stop, don't do that. We don't listen. But Sometimes you che- no. Most of the time, no. But mm-hmm. you check us physically, ooh. Right. Like you look at guys and you look at like in more primitive cultures or even just even looking like other like other sports and football and stuff like that. If one of the dudes gets in line, you know, like I remember playing football. If one of the guys was being a, a jerk. Yeah. You get checked a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like in, 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 you know, how do you keep each other honest? Like, right. Just even like talking about jujitsu itself. He was talking about how do you keep honest? You get punched in the face. Yeah. You get checked a little bit. Add and blows. So, and so, again, you know, you couldn't do some of that stuff now because it's like, oh, my God, you're just being too mean. Um, anyway, uh, off topic. So I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Uh, guys, again, if you want to support the podcast and get yourself some stuff at a big discount right now um, because Christmas is coming up, so they're, you know, throwing that stuff out at you. So if you want it, I mean, if you've been thinking about trying some CBD, try it out. Top Shelf CBD for 30% off. You can go to charlotteweb.com. Use promo code jujitsu 30 Save 30% off of everything in their store. Try whatever it is that you want to try. Give it a whirl. If it works for you, fantastic. You can join the, the people like me that swear by the stuff. If it mm. doesn't work for you, then you don't, you don't use it. No big big deal. No harm, no foul. Epic Roll BJJ, 30% off of whatever he's got in the store using promo code jujitsu 30 Along with the or the Ocean uh, Storm Gi, which is a, with the discount's going to be ninety eight bucks. So if you want a really slick looking gi uh, for a pretty good price, that's one to check out. And then again, if you're looking for a trimmer for your your chest, maybe your beard or your face, or maybe your downstairs, check out Manscaped. I um I tried it. I like it. It's a good good trimmer. So yeah. you can get twenty percent off using the promo code Chichitsu on their website, Manscaped.com. And uh, if you want to support the podcast directly, go to uh, patreon.com slash jujitsu and you can, or excuse me, patreon.com slash the jujitsu podcast. And you can jump in and again, check out the options that they have. I've already told you about all the cool stuff that's in there from workout programs to extra content, the whole deal. So if you want to get that, check it out. And then guys, if you want to join the Chew crew and be a part of my email list, I send out a daily email. And along with that, there you get some free resources for your training. If you want to get that, go to jujitsu.net. And if you look up the, uh, there's a button that says like free ebook, just click on that. And then you can join in and you'll get an email usually once a day from me. And again, you'll get some free training resources and you can unsubscribe at any time you want to. Um, but that's that. So, yeah. Check out the video version of the podcast. Oh, yeah. On our YouTube channel, the Jujitsu Podcast. 
And if you like the podcast, leave us a five star review. Why not? So, if, so here's the thing. So, okay. So, if you're listening to this, you're listening to this podcast, and you're like, you know, guys, I really like this podcast. I'm trying to think of the voice that you, the listener, would be given. <laughs> I mean, you might be a female, so you know, you'd be like, maybe I'll give you the Jess voice. Hey, podcast. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that right hey, now. Nick. Hey, Nick. I really like your podcast. Um, <laughs> so if you if you if you like the podcast, um, if you like the podcast, you're like I listen to this damn thing every Monday or whatever you know the, whenever your time is your ritual for it is. If you don't have any money and you're broke and you can't buy anything, it's okay. And you still want to support the podcast? There's a really easy way to do it. Two options, two things that you can do right now, right now. Well, if you're driving, don't do it right now because I don't want you to wreck. You know, if you, I mean, you can pull over, but I, if you, you got places to go. So here's what you do. So it's your next available convenience, your next available convenience. Head on over to YouTube. You can go to our little thing, you put in, you put in YouTube, put in the Dutch Jiu-Jitsu podcast, and you can check out the videos if you want to watch them there. I honestly watch, I have YouTube Red, so I watch most of my podcasts on YouTube anyway. But you can go in there and you can click subscribe. And then after that, if you're like, you're like, no, but Chewy, I don't listen to them this place, then go to wherever you listen to this podcast at that allows you to put up a review and just put up a review. Give us a good review. If you listen to the podcast, you must think it's worth something. You must think it's decent. You enjoy it to some degree, right? So why not? It'll take like, it'll take like two minutes. Get on the, and probably not even two minutes. You just get in there and leave us a good review, say something, maybe something that was interesting. And, um, I think we're on Amazon. Uh, like you can go tell Alexa to listen to the podcast now. What, really? Yeah, I think so. Huh. Did you do that? I haven't tried it yet, but I think we're. Well, you can do you go, have an Alexa? No, I don't. I don't have an Alexa. Well, I'm, you can I'm go to bring, Alexa. I'm not bringing that in my house. You can go, hey, Alexa, I want to listen to the Jiu Jitsu podcast, and it should pop up. Huh. Wasn't that nifty? Um, so whatever. So you can talk to Alexa and maybe she'll do, do maybe she'll do a review do you, for you. Do you remember that? Uh, Alexa, do do a review for the Jiu Jitsu podcast for me. The SNL skit where like, it was like uh, Alexa Silver or something. It was like for old people. And they were like, they were, <laughs> they were like naming, they were saying all kinds of other, it was like, a Flexa. And they, they couldn't hear what she was saying. They were mm-hmm. arguing with Alexa. Okay. I didn't do it justice, but it was pretty funny. Man, I don't have a TV and I don't. Ah, you well. Know. I like you know I, I watch a show <laughs> like Jess and I just watched uh, we just watched the boys yes so that, that was a pretty fantastic it, it was something it was watch Mandalorian by the way uh, I haven't got around oh. to it oh but uh, that's the best Star Wars thing it, it was uh it, it was like it was it was dark and interesting so good. funny at some points but I don't know sometimes it's like it's it was a little dark for me sometimes I'm like man I had to, I had to take breaks yeah it's uh it's pretty heavy. Well, I mean, but, just some parts you're just like, damn, man, I just don't want to, like, like I, I want to watch something that makes me feel a little bit better. You weren't rewinding it at the people exploding part. Where well, you're... no, it's not like that. It's like you, <laughs> like there are there are no good characters. It's like I mean, everybody's, I mean, everybody's in this is where you're like you know, good and good and evil, good and bad are very interchangeable depending on whose eyes you're looking through. You know, because when you're looking at the show, you're like, every one of those characters has killed someone. Everyone's flawed. Everyone's flawed, but it's like, what? Where, where is the line? And it depends on your perception. That's what makes it intriguing. That's yeah. what makes it an interesting pod, uh, pod, it's interesting not a podcast. Show. Eugene. I it's get a, it's it. a video I know, on Netflix. You know what I'm on. Or not Netflix, Amazon Prime. Oh, see, you messed up and yeah, you're yelling at me. I know. But anyway, but, but yeah, so going back to what I was saying before Eugene interrupted with what it is gobbledygook. Um, if you guys like the podcast, if you're here listening, if you're still here right now, why are you still listening? Like the podcast has been. Why done. are you here, Chris Howder? <laughs> Chris Howder has long since exited this podcast, and you're still listening. You're driving your car. You're sitting at home doing whatever. I mean, you might be on the pooper. I don't know. And you're listening to this podcast. You might be taking a shower. Some of you. Some of you. The last time I said that, I was like, you might be taking a shower. Some of you guys were like, I was taking a shower. It was like you were in here with me. I was watching. Um, I said that in a video, and they were like, they were literally like, I was taking a shower. They had their phone propped up. Oh my god! Yeah, should we should do a giveaway? What's that? The first person to email the Shujitsu podcast and tell us what they're doing, unless you're driving, we'll give you. What do we give them? Ah, right, here's what we do. Here's what we do. All oh right. boy, here's what we do. For all the for all you guys that are still listening to us right now, I'm gonna put my my deeper voice in here and talk to you for a second. For those of you that have not given us a review and have not subscribed, here's your chance to win something. 
Okay. Sounding almost like a foghorn leghorn. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said. Um, <laughs> if you mm-hmm. subscribe. Yes. Or leave a review. How do we know? Take a screenshot and email it to us. I was email get, it to me. I was getting there. I just, I just need you. I need you. I need you to be like, like a, like a. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 There. I need, I need like backup stuff. Like every time I say something, I want you to answer like yes. Uh huh. All right. There we go. There we go. Okay. So if you guys want to win something, preach. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting out of hand. <laughs> We're in the we're Say like, it with me now. We're in the podcast room in the basement. Nobody knows anything. We're like all alone, no windows, nothing. <laughs> it's it's, like, I don't it's know. like a bomb shelter. It kind of is, man. Double, we're in the basement. Double drive. Nobody wall. knows we're here. Um <laughs> but if you guys want to win something, here's what you do. Go to YouTube, go and subscribe and go to the um wherever like you wherever you listen to this darn thing at if it allows you to do a review go do a review and then take a screenshot of that and then send it to what's the email the jujitsu podcast at gmail the the jujitsu podcast at gmail and if you do said task we will give a few gifts away now it's funny thing i can't i can't do this this time but the last time i did this every person that sent me a message on Instagram, I gave them I gave them a link to the free video series. I said I was only going to give it to the first, but I got so many of you guys sending me messages. I sent everybody the free link. Now I'm not going to do that this time, but I will provide some prizes to you. So if you do that, I'm not going to tell you what the prizes are. Okay, it's going to be a surprise. It's a surprise. It's going to be a surprise for you to find out what's going to be. I don't know what accent that is. If you want the surprise, do the task. I don't even know what the surprise is. Of course you don't. I just make it up. I give them something. Maybe B C D C B D. Maybe it's T shirt. Maybe it's course. I don't know. B C B D C B D B. If you want some zibida. <laughs> oh man. So if you guys want something, just do the do the task. You you have your mission. Should should you choose to accept it, your mission is to do those things and then send an email to the Jiu Jitsu Podcast at Gmail. Don't send me a don't send me an Instagram message. Don't send me a Facebook message. Don't send me an email. The Jiu Jitsu Podcast at Gmail. And then we will go through and we will reward those that take action. So that's that. That is the end of the show. Thank you guys for joining us. And for those those poor souls that are still with us to this point, I appreciate you. You're awesome. And I'm glad you're here. You have work to do. Yes. Do said work. Mm-hmm.